I have the microphone here, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> I won't be alone, only about 30 minutes, and then you can take it. Perfect. Take as much time as you like. No, I'm not going to do that, because we all come here to, uh, to listen to you, David. So uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you, David Shelley. I'm very grateful that you could make it at fairly short notice. And we're all looking forward to, of course, uh, your talk. Uh, you've been meeting with quite a few people, I think, already, and maybe this afternoon, although you've leave at about 4.30, 5 o'clock. Yes, I'm not conquered in Boston traffic again. <laughs> anyway, David Shelley, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, one of the few times that you made it to Boston. Uh, David got his PhD in uh, 2007, if I'm not mistaken, from Stanford. And he was one of the pioneers working at that time on what they called non-volcanic tremor. And there was a lot of new, you know, uh, data and observations coming about, in particular from the Mankai Trough in, uh, in Japan. And David was one of the leaders uh, in the third cohort of people uh, looking at that, you know, completely new type of uh, seismic signal. And you know, maybe we'll hear a bit more about it uh, later. Um, after graduating from Stanford, uh, we went uh, far away across the uh, ocean to uh, Berkeley. <laughs> um, to become a Miller Fellow <coughs> across the Bay Area and then back to close to where you belong in, in, Stan in Stanford to um, become a Mendenhall uh, postdoc at uh, Mendenhall Park and then he subsequently stayed at, at the USDS in that same area only to be located closer to the East Coast to Colorado uh, early this year and so they were still working for the USDS and probably we're going to spend some time in Golden, Colorado. We reminisced about it yesterday over and over dinner, so that was very nice. Um, I very much look forward to, uh, to your talk. Uh, Dave has done a lot of very exciting work in, in the process, got many awards, in particular with the career awards that are very prestigious, like the Richter Awards from the Seismological Society of America, uh, the Aki Awards uh, from the American Geophysical Union, and the McElwain Medal, I think in 2012, from the American Geophysical Union. Um, so that's really a testimony to the fantastic work that you've been doing. Uh, without further ado, I very much look forward to your talk. And um, David, take it away. Thank you. And so, I can go to this. All right, thanks very much. Appreciate the introduction, very kind. So, I'm not actually going to talk about uh, non volcanic or tectonic tremor today. I'm going to focus on earthquake swarms, which is what I've been working on mostly for the last several years. Um, still working part time on, on tremor stuff. But uh, I've, I've found earthquake swarms to be quite fascinating. And um, Basically, the goal of this talk and the goal of the work that I've been doing lately is to try to um, basically wring as much information as possible out of the seismological data, which is, is really the most direct information we have about these processes that are happening deep in the earth. So, I mean, this is just sort of a cartoon example, but, you know, going from this kind of a fuzzy cloud of seismicity to, 
um, taking more full advantage of the, the seismic data and getting a much clearer, sharper picture of what's happening in these earthquake swarms. Um, you know, with the, the eventual goal of, of really kind of pinning down the physics that is responsible for, um, for earthquake swarms. And I, I think, uh, I'll touch on this at several points in the talk, but I think earthquake swarms in many cases are really um, highlighting this, this very close interaction between faulting and fluid diffusion in the crust. Um, and you can't really, can't really separate those processes um, into one causing the other, that they're very closely intertwined. And uh, various people have contributed uh, parts of this, this work, but uh, any errors or omissions are, are mine. Okay, so just to get everyone on the, on the same page, uh, people sometimes think of earthquake swarms as kind of odd or mysterious phenomenon. Um, and in some ways that's true, but in other ways they're part of the everyday uh, seismic activity of the Earth. Um, usually the earthquake swarms look a little bit different than the one you might remember seeing in the movie San Andreas. Uh, I hear there's a sequel coming out sometime soon. Uh, but uh, earthquake swarms are, what I mean by earthquake swarm is just you know, any sequence of earthquakes that is above sort of typical rates and doesn't follow kind of a nice for a main shock aftershock sequence. And these types of, of sequences are common in, in volcanic and hydrothermal areas especially. But we've also seen a lot of this kind of seismicity in areas of fluid injection recently, like Oklahoma. And we also see earthquake swarms in tectonic areas that are really not volcanic or hydrothermal areas. They tend to be um, fault stepovers or extensional areas. And, you know, there, there are several reasons why earthquake swarms are interesting, kind of from, uh, um, you know, a, a practical USGS perspective that they're, you know, earthquake swarms cause a lot of public anxiety. We start hearing about them when people start feeling the earthquakes. Um, you can see uh, people are very concerned here. Um, there is a possibility that, you know, earthquake swarms could be, could lead up to larger events. Um, earthquake swarms almost always precede volcanic activity, um, especially in a volcano that hasn't erupted in a while. Um, yet at the same time, you know, only a very small percentage of earthquake swarms actually lead to, to an eruption. And then from a more kind of fundamental science perspective that swarms are really just a really fascinating opportunity to learn about sort of earthquake physics and interactions with fluids um, and sometimes even to learn about structures deep in the earth. So I think as I, I was already arguing that, you know, th these are some really interesting processes that are happening um, in the earth. and. The seismic data is really the most direct information we have about these processes. You know, sometimes we can see subtle deformations of the surface. You might be able to detect a uh, change in, in other geophysical methods like gravity or MT, but the earthquake, earthquakes data provide, you know, kind of a resolution that is um, in many ways um, higher, better than, than many other techniques. So it's really important to use you know, to get as much as we can out of this seismic data. And typically, I mean, this is, has been in many ways underutilized in the past. So we're going to put on our, our geophysicist glasses and sort of go from the, the nearsighted Chihuahua view to the uh, sharper view here where you can, you can start to see fault structures, you can see migration with time, um, and, you know, like many of the things, the closer you look, the more complicated things get, but there's lots of uh, there's lots of information in that complexity that we can use to understand the, the underlying processes. So overall, we, we wanted a lot of the work that I've, I've done is, is focused on detecting more earthquakes, locating them more precisely, and characterizing them more thoroughly, like understanding their magnitudes, and most recently trying to understand their focal mechanisms. Um, so the, the sense of slip for many of these, these tiny points on, on this plot, on this map. Okay, so the first step is, um, I guess, event detection. And um, I've 
used a, a fairly simple technique over the last few years um, to try to detect more earthquakes. This is an example. Basically, we're taking all of the catalog events that we already know about. We want to take advantage of you know, the work that's already being done and the information that we already have. Uh, this is the waveform signature across several stations. This is actually an example from, uh, from Mount Rainier, but the, the principle is the same. That here I've separated them out into S waves in red and, sorry, P waves in red and S waves in blue. Um, and so we have sort of a P and S wave signature across uh, multiple stations for each, for each event. We take this signature, we scan it through the continuous data, and we identify times in the continuous data where we see similar signatures. Um, and so here's an example. So that same template is in red and blue here, and it's overlaid on a smaller event. Uh, the amplitudes are, are scaled. So the smaller event is in the, the black or gray underlying traces here. And you can see, um, you know, generally the, the signatures are quite similar across all the stations. We can measure, this is the correlation function with lag time for S and P across all these stations. And you can see they all have a nice neat peak here around uh, zero lag time. That's uh, the summed peak at the bottom. So we can say, aha, here's an event in the continuous data that we otherwise missed that looks like one of, um, one of the cataloged events. Uh, but we can actually take this a step further if we, this is plus or minus four seconds here on the time. If we blow up this time scale, so instead of plus or minus four seconds, we, we expand it to plus or minus four hundredths of a second. The shading here is um, the correlation function, so the white shading is, is the peak in that. And instead of aligning precisely at zero, so if these were two events in exactly the same location, we'd see these peaks all aligning precisely at zero. But when we expand this time scale, we can see very clearly that there are deviations from that time. And so these are lag times, you know, maybe a hundredth or two hundredths of a second, um, sometimes less. And we can directly use these to solve for the, the relative locations of these events. And after we combine you know, thousands of these, me millions of these measurements for thousands of events. Um, you know, in this, two in this case, uh, the template and this detected event end up being about 37 meters apart, or at least that's our, our estimate of the relative location. So in ideal cases, we can get relative location precision, you know, on the order of a few meters, which really gives you a, a much uh, sharper view of what's, what's happening compared to catalog uncertainties that may be hundreds of meters or even, in some cases, kilometers. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to um, show examples of, of two different earthquake swarms, uh, both from the, the Long Valley region in California, Eastern California. So here's San Francisco for reference. Uh, if you could drive straight east from San Francisco, you would run into uh, Long Valley after a couple hundred kilometers. Um, Long Valley is, you know, something like 15 by 30 kilometers in dimension. It had a, a super eruption about 760,000 years ago, uh, forming the, the Bishop Tuff uh, deposit. Since then, there's, there's been a lot of smaller eruptions, but really in the last um, few hundred thousand years, there's been very little eruptive activity within the caldera. Uh, but we do see evidence for um, unrest in the caldera. The caldera has been uplifting episodically uh, at least since 1980. Um, there's debate about, you know, sort of the relative contributions of aqueous fluids being like being exalted from deeper magma source and shallower injections of magma. Um, but there's a lot of evidence in the, both in the seismicity and in the deformation that there are, you know, fluids active in this system. This is a cartoon from, from Dave Hill showing some of the you know, seismicity down to eight or nine kilometers within the caldera. In fact, beneath Mammoth Mountain, we get some seismicity down to 20 or more um, kilometers. The swarms I'm going to highlight were both from 2014, just a few years ago. Uh, the first one will be under Mammoth Mountain here, and the second one out uh, within the caldera. Yeah. Uh, using the certain 
probably takes shape as you should. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that you are assuming the physics of events or earthquakes are self similar or generally similar to each other? Vice versa is correct, maybe? Yeah, so it's it's to some degree it's true that we'll do the best job detecting events that look similar to our templates. Most of what's most of that shape that you see there is not source process. The source process is you know these are small magnitude one two three events. The source processes tend to be a fraction of a second. So almost all of the shape you see is the Green's function. So. And that's partly why this technique ends up working so well, is that you know, you're essentially putting an impulse into the ground in whatever location. And as you know, if you, um, mostly that complexity is coming from largely the, sh the shallow structure near the receiver, but also on the, on the path between the source and the receiver. So you, know, you won't detect everything, but you're not really making very strong assumptions about the you know, the source physics in that case. Okay, so, so Mammoth Mountain, here's uh, the caldera outline here. Mammoth is kind of this uh, bump just outside the caldera. There's great skiing there if you ever get a chance. Um, but one of the, the interesting features of Mammoth are you know, all these yellow areas here are areas where trees have been killed by elevated uh, CO2 emissions, um, you know, in the last few decades. Here's a, a photograph of one near Horseshoe Lake, and you can see uh, this area is where trees were able to grow, you know, at some point in the past, but the CO2 emissions have increased and killed off those trees. So we know that there's a lot of CO2 coming out here. Uh, presumably it's sourced from, you know, a deep magmatic source, you know, at some point. Um, but we know that there's there's at least CO2 coming up through this, this system. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and the 2014 swarm is basically centered on the, on the summit here, uh, about five kilometers depth. Okay, so this, this plot is a map view showing all the blue is um, background seismicity from 1984 to 2015. The red is seismicity associated with this swarm. Um, there's kind of a dashed white line here that's uh, an inferred kind of ring fracture zone from previous work. It's kind of interesting that this swarm kind of tracks the, uh, the eastern extension of that structure. If we look in map view, um, here's the AA prime cross section. And it kind of just looks like a, a thick zone of seismicity here. And that's, that's really what, what it is, but I'll show in a moment that uh, on shorter time scales, we can start to see some more defined uh, structures in there. You know, this is a few hundred meters thick. It's probably pervasively fractured. And then there are these uh, kind of shallower structures uh, that are seismically disconnected from the main source zone. Uh, in this case, the largest earthquake was a uh, magnitude 3.1. All these red events happened over about 16 days uh, in February. And with the kind of template matching technique that we're doing, we're able to, to look at four times as many events as were in the original catalog. And this is just a, a 3D perspective to kind of uh, help you get a little bit of sense of scale. Here's Mammoth Mountain, and here's the earthquake swarm, you know, five kilometers or so beneath, um, beneath the surface. And here are these kind of uh, shallower structures as well. How uh, frequent are these earthquakes? How many earthquakes a day or whatever? So in this swarm or in general? No, in this swarm. This swarm? Uh, so the w we think we're able to do a pretty good job locating about 6,000 events over 16 days. So um, So do you have a problem associating you know, PNS to the same event? Are there issues there that might throw off the locations? Uh, you know, they, these stations are, are local stations. They're close to the source. So sometimes you do get a whole bunch of events that are very close in time. Yeah. And that's actually one of the cases where identifying events by matching the whole waveform rather than just looking for the onset. Um, that, that's why, one of the reasons why this technique works better than traditional seismic processing. Mm 
is because we're looking at the whole waveform rather than just looking for the onset of the P and S waves. Okay, and, and here is a plot uh, showing time on the horizontal axis. This is distance from just from the first event. Um, I've put on a couple curves here just for reference. Don't read too much into this, but these would, would be for diffusivities of uh, 0.25 or 0.5 meters squared per second. Um, here's the, the largest, when the largest earthquake of the swarm happens, this magnitude 3.1, you can see kind of a, a migrating aftershock sequence. I'll show that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. One of the interesting things here now this is depth versus time. You can see things are quite concentrated in that kind of main swarm zone for most of the, the swarm. And it's really only as the seismicity starts to die off here late in the swarm that you see activation of these shallower structures. So you might imagine um, fluid being confined in this main zone for m much of the swarm and then late in the swarm it essentially starts leaking and you start activating some of those um, shallower structures that happen to be very close to failure if you have a small fluid pressure perturbation expanding through the, the shallower crust. Uh, so I put this plot up just um, in the context of these thick seismic zones. They, they seem to be kind of fracture mesh structures and that it means that there's a series of kind of interlocking um, probably both shear and extensional faults. Um, this was first envisioned by Dave Hill in a paper in the 70s. Um, and you can imagine a number of, of geometries. Rick Simpson uh, explored this a bit more in the 90s. So just kind of keep these types of models in mind when I show some of the, um, some of the more detailed seismicity from this, this thick zone, the main swarm zone um, from, this, from this swarm. Okay, so this is um, the large, sorry, map view and cross section. Uh, this is the largest event, magnitude 3.1, and this is that kind of interesting uh, migrating aftershock sequence. This circle size represents, you know, sort of just a rough estimate of the, the source dimension if you assume a, a 3 megapascal stress drop. So you can see this aftershock sequence is well outside of the, the source dimension of, of this earthquake or the anticipated source dimension. Uh, we see other things like on echelon faulting. Here's a snapshot. Um, the, the colored events are from a three hour time window here, um, and the, the color represents their relative position in that window. So, here's an example where we seem to see kind of a series of on echelon faults, uh, both in map view and in cross section. That kind of fits with this uh, fracture mesh uh, concept. And then late in the swarm, we see more what you might call a single fault uh, activation. We see very pronounced migration on those structures. So I'll, I'll sh just to give you a little bit better sense, I'll show an animation of uh, the first and the last of those examples. Uh, the, the cross section is this kind of northwest to southeast cross section that I was showing before. And um, events are color coded with time through this sliding window. So everything shows up in red and kind of transitions through the color spectrum to help your eye track the seismicity. So this one on the left will be the magnitude, uh, the magnitude 3.1 and then it's aftershock sequence. So I'll start this here. Uh, if you look at the map view, I guess especially, you can see there's the magnitude 3 and then the kind of migrating aftershock sequence, kind of this wave of earthquakes propagating through there. I'll play that one more time. So you can th see things that are kind of initial, there's a little bit of a pause and then things initiate on the up tip edge and propagate laterally in that case. Now if we look at the right hand figure, uh, things in black are things that have already happened. So we've pretty much fractured this and then this is late in the swarm where this structure becomes active and kind of you see it, uh, very systematic migration kind of zipping along that, that structure and these things kind of become active progressively. So one of the uh, 
plausible explanation of uh, this magnitude 3 event and its the aftershock sequence is that this earthquake may have opened up a new you know fluid pathway from a region of higher to a region of lower fluid pressure um, here's the seismogram this is three hours across this whole thing here's the magnitude 3.1 here are kind of immediate aftershocks that are right within these are the little blue dots within the basically within the source region these kind of die out there's a little bit of a pause here and then this is the start of this propagating what I call a wave of seismicity in the in the up dip edge of that event so at least a, a plausible explanation is that that magnitude 3 you know breaks open this new pathway connects a region of higher fluid pressure that then flows into the fault zone and eventually propagates into that up dip edge um, and activates the sh shallower uh, aftershocks by elevating the fluid pressure in that region. <laughs> yeah, so this is an hour from here to here, so it's about 45 minutes after the magnitude 3 that this um, that the shallower events initiate. So there's, you know, 15 minutes of aftershocks within the source zone, basically, and there's about half an hour of quiet, and then there's, um, that's about 45 minutes after this event is when these events initiate. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that delay? The time delay? Well, you know, one possible explanation is that it's the time delay that it takes basically fluid pressure from this deeper zone to diffuse up into this shallower zone and activate those events. So is there any surgical calculation to prove that one, like in terms of diffusion time from the certain depths to the public quality? Well, yeah, to do that you'd have to know, for one thing, how much pore space you're creating during the magnitude three. Initially, you you actually would probably expect fluid to flow into this fault zone from both the shallower and the deeper zones, and then uh, it takes some time, you know, to diffuse up there. So no, we haven't done detailed modeling. That would be really interesting to do to try to explore that a little bit more. Um, you know, sort of what the implications might be for the uh, diffusivity for the uh, permeability. Any other questions on this part before I go on to the next? Did you say how you're getting absolute locations? Because you are plotting absolute locations. We are plotting absolute locations. The absolute locations are essentially um, the s centroid of the absolute locations stays the same as the centroid of the initial locations. So they are to some degree controlled by, in, in centroid I mean in a, of all the events. So they are in, to some degree controlled by the initial locations that are from the catalog, you know, based on the P and S arrival times and a simple velocity model. Mm -hmm. For most of the interpretations here, the, you know, if the absolute locations vary by a few hundred meters, it doesn't change the interpretations too much. So you're confident that the shallow structure that happens later in the sequence really is shallow? Yeah, so the, the... Do you have differential times? We have differential times that are tying, you know, these events to each other. So this, you know, all these events are essentially located relative to each other. There's a fairly yeah. dense web of differential times right. tying all those events together. Okay, so that was an example of kind of this fracture mesh dominated swarm. Uh, the one I'm going to show here happened just um, a few months later, actually uh, basically for five months from, from the end of May to the end of, of October in, um, in 2014. It's out in the caldera, so before we were looking over here at Mammoth Mountain, we're, now we're 10 kilometers away here out in the kind of the south central caldera. <coughs> This is what it looked like on just the routine monitoring map. Just looks like a, you know, big pile of, of earthquakes. Um, 
So we'll try to, uh, to delve into this a little bit more. So this, this swarm, um, biggest earthquake was magnitude 3.5. There were about 3,300 events in the catalog after the analysts had gone back through and you know, sort of caught up with it. Uh, after we, we do the processing, we have almost 8,500 that uh, can be precisely located. We're using 39 million cross-correlation differential times to, um, to help constrain those locations. And this time we take an extra step and we calculate magnitudes uh, for the newly detected events. Um, it turns out it's a lot, you need less data to estimate a magnitude than you do to estimate a relative location. Um, so we're able to get magnitudes for more than 18,000 events from this sequence. This is kind of the, the timeline of, of the swarm. It, in many ways it was a swarm of swarms. Um, here's kind of the initial activity at the end of May, early June. Um, there was kind of a, an interesting event in early July. At this time we thought, you know, this was, was maybe the main event, but it kind of petered along here for several months and then really took off at the end of September. Um, and then kind of decayed throughout, throughout October and into November. And I, I guess I should say that all the red events here are in the catalog and the blue events are newly detected. So we're able to extend the, the detection down about a full magnitude um, unit, at least for, um, for magnitudes calculations. This is uh, just a comparison of the original catalog locations and what this looks like after we've detected and relocated <laughs> events. Um, so here we have you know, two and a half times as many events and things are much more precisely located. So instead of just being a blob of seismicity, we can start to see fault structures. You can see migration with time. This is the color scale. This is showing the whole thing, but the color scale is truncated to show kind of the most active part of the swarm um, at the end of September and early October. So you can imagine it would be pretty hard to, uh, to model or to understand what physics is driving activity based on this information, but at least here we have uh, something to work with. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to show a little animation of the, the migration behavior during this July, um, you might call subswarm. Um, for this part of the activity, this is uh, distance from the first event versus time, and this is depth versus time. And this shows somewhat of a familiar pattern for these swarms, which is it may show both down dip and up dip migration, but the down dip limb dies off very quickly while the up dip limb persists on for quite a while. And this is another you know, piece of evidence that suggests that, that fluid uh, diffusion, fluid propagation is important um, in these sequences. So I'll play this animation. Uh, this is a map view and cross section, but I've rotated the map view so that the cross section will correspond uh, more directly here. And if you look, especially at the cross section here, it kind of initiates, it's almost like somebody's hooking up a fire hose to the fault right there, at least that's how um, it seems to me. And you can see seismicity is propagating, you know, away and over the longer time scale up. And it, but it has kind of this episodic nature, you may get a relatively large event, in this case, you know, magnitude two or something. And then you see a sequence of kind of aftershocks rimming that event, and things kind of, you know, go in, in jumps and starts. So that may be that, you know, of course, when you, when you have an earthquake, you're doing two things. You're, uh, you're transferring stress to the neighboring parts of the fault, but you're also opening up the permeability in that part that's been ruptured. So you may have, I'll play this one more time, you may have, you know, essentially when you rupture part of this fault, the fluid may be able to fill in quite rapidly behind that. And even if the initial stress transfer is not sufficient to trigger immediate continuation of the activity, and once that fluid fills in behind, it may, in, you know, in combination with that stress transfer, it may continue on with the swarm.
Okay, so here's uh, a couple months later in September, and this is when things got really exciting. Uh, these are the same kinds of plots, distance from the first event versus time, and depth versus time. Again, you can see that pattern of both down dip and up dip migration, but the down dip limb terminating quite quickly compared to the up dip limb. And this is the point where you know, people were really starting to feel these earthquakes. There were three magnitude, three and a half events um, on one day. And of course, when people start feeling the earthquakes, that's when the media gets interested and, um, and so forth. So I'll start this. Um, in many ways, it looks similar to you know, the, what we were seeing in July. This, is, this structure is actually kind of just offset a few hundred meters and kind of up dip from what was active in July. Here are the magnitude three and a half events across the center here. And then things kind of wrap around uh, on the down dip edge and die out pretty quickly while the up dip part is just getting going. And you start to see on the map view here that the up dip seismicity kind of starts deviating from this, this main trend that was active earlier and you start getting these, um, in some cases probably conjugate structures becoming activated. Um, so just a, a bigger diversity of faulting. And we'll come back to that um, when I look at focal mechanisms for this, for this sequence. Okay, so I mentioned that, that we do um, take that extra step of looking at magnitudes uh, for this sequence. It's a little bit tricky because the magnitudes are, or sorry, the for the small events, the signal to noise ratio is, is pretty low. Um, ideally, we would go back and, well, I guess I should say the other thing is that the, the catalog magnitudes aren't perfect. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the catalog magnitudes. In this case, most of the catalog magnitudes are duration magnitudes. That's the MD designation. So, you know, in an ideal world, we'd go back and try to estimate moment magnitudes for everything, but that probably would have been its own study um, all by itself. So we took a little bit more pragmatic approach and um, tried to just kind of continue the scaling that we saw in the duration magnitude. So this plot on the right is um, for events that are in the catalog. I sorry, I, I guess I should explain this. For each pair of events where we calculate a differential time, we also calculate a relative amplitude. And we do that just by, so we you know, align the seismograms as best we can, and then we plot, this is the, you know, every data point, the newly detected, the amplitude of the newly detected event versus the amplitude of the template event. And often these are actually relatively similar magnitudes, so we fit this with a principal component fit so that it fits, it minimizes the perpendicular distance rather than the, just the vertical distance. Okay, and then uh, to actually translate that relative amplitude into a magnitude, we compare what the, we look at the catalog events and the differences in magnitude for pairs of catalog events compared to this amplitude ratio that we observe. And what's kind of interesting is that, um, so at these magnitudes, we're measuring the amplitude below the corner frequencies. It should be proportional to the moment of the events, which means that for a local magnitude, we would expect a slope of about one. For a moment magnitude, we would expect a slope of about two thirds. In this case, the duration magnitudes are kind of splitting the difference. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> sort of just, just what it is. It's a, it's a duration magnitude, it's sort of its own beast. Um, so we, we take this slope, it's about 0.8, and we use that to take this amplitude ratio that we've measured between catalog events and newly detected events to assign a magnitude to the newly detected events. And it is robust in the sense that we're not just looking at peak amplitudes, we're looking at um, you know, a, a fit of the relative amplitudes and we're looking at many stations and averaging everything together in a, in a median sense. So even though you get very different answers if you chose a different slope here, um, we, do, um, we do get a repeatable uh, result, I guess. Yeah, I should check that. 
Okay, so one thing that's, that's neat about this is that we can actually do a very good job because we have both precise locations and a good idea of event magnitudes over a fairly broad magnitude range, even though our maximum event size is pretty small, we can actually start to compare the, the patterns of earthquake location and frequency magnitude relationships. So this is the Gutenberg-Richter B value um, that you know, reflects the, the relative prevalence of small versus large magnitude events. This is the evolution of that B value over the course of the swarm, and the black line is correcting for times where the event rate is so high that we've basically saturated uh, the number of events that we can detect even with uh, cross-correlation based detection. Um, so I know it's hard to track four panels at once, but I'll play this animation. This is a fixed number of events in time, so each of these is showing a thousand events. Um, and you can see the B value is uh, climbing here. It's going to sink to its minimum level at the point where things are very concentrated um, on the fault. And then it's going to kind of systematically climb here um, through the remainder of the swarm as the seismicity becomes increasingly diffuse. As the seismicity seems to be activating more and more uh, smaller dimension structures. So if we let this, this play out, you can see that uh, toward the end, things are quite scattered. It's not a single fault, but it's a whole bunch of different faults that are being activated. Things are, um, there's even a few things that are off the, the map plot here because they're more um, diffuse. So if we compare just the extremes of this, this is the extreme low B value point and the map view and cross section distributions and the extreme high B value point, map view and cross section, um, you can you can really see that that contrast. So what this what may be happening here is that at this point we may be confining fluid and actually channeling it along this this basically one main fault. So as uh, instead of randomly activating whatever cracks there might be in the earth, we're preferentially activating the extension of this one relatively large fault that you know that we know exists, as opposed to later in the swarm it looks like the fluid has lost that confinement and is propagating more in three dimensions and essentially, you know, to a greater extent, just sampling whatever fault distribution there is in the crust. So I think, you know, this is a little bit different explanation for different uh, B values. Uh, sometimes people cite, you know, differences in differential stress, but I think you can't discount the role in essentially the physical dimension of the faults that are being activated. Yeah, yeah, I should have said that. It's a thousand events in a moving window. So this, in the lower right plot, the shaded zone shows the events that are being used for that B-value estimate. And then, you know, the map and cross-sections are also showing the events that are being used for that B-value estimate. So, so we're calculating B values by maximum likelihood, which means each earthquake is weighted equally. So just having a few large magnitude events is not going to have a meaningful impact on the B values. It's essentially, you know, all the events down here that are controlling the B values. <coughs> You mentioned that um, the signal to noise isn't great for a lot of these events. Yeah. So is the detection threshold varying with that event depth so that you're not seeing the you're not seeing the deeper events because they're below the, the noise with the same event shallower you would see? And are you, do you have any artifacts of, the, of that kind of thing going on? So, yeah, there there will be some there will be some effect of the depth. I mean, at Events at seven kilometers depth, you know, we know the closest station, well, in this case there is a two kilometer borehole, but in most cases, most of the stations are at least seven kilometers away, um, as opposed to in the shallower end, you know, at least five kilometers away. So, you know, there is some effect, but that effect is relatively small, and we try to be conservative about, we're using a cutoff magnitude of minus 
Um, but we try to be pretty conservative, that's this line here, we try to be pretty conservative about where that is so that we're not missing a meaningful number of events you know, above that magnitude for any time or any part on this, um, any depth, I guess, as you were asking. Yeah, I think I'm thinking not just of the V-value um, analysis, but just the fact that the uh, downward moving events petered out but there were shallow events. Yeah, if yeah. If those shallow events had been of the same magnitude but deeper, would you have detected them? Uh, for the most part, yes, mm -hmm. but there will be some that aren't detected. So you, you could explain, you know, maybe a 20% difference that way, but you're not going to explain, uh -huh. you know, a factor of many yeah. difference just by that depth difference. Because, the, you know, the, the distances to the stations, most of the stations are separated horizontally, by the way, so you might be talking about you know, just a kilometer, it, it's a relatively small, you know, 10% difference in source to receiver distance or something in uh, most cases from the deeper to the yeah, shallower. Right. Yeah. Okay, so the last part, uh, hopefully I have time to go through this, um, is in, in most cases people basically ignore focal mechanisms when you're looking at really small earthquakes and that be, that's because they're essentially notoriously unreliable um, and focal mechanisms are really you know kind of the weak link in oftentimes um, and they're important because they do tell you you know you can look at the orientations of the, the earthquake locations but the focal mechanisms are actually reflecting the orientation of slip in these events which is um, in some cases, a different, a different thing. I'll show, um, I'll show that here in just a moment. So we were, for this particular swarm, we had 39 million cross-correlation differential times. So there's a lot of data, and it would be great if we could use those cross-correlation measurements to constrain the focal mechanisms, to constrain the, the orientations of slip. So that's, that's what we tried to do. Um, in this paper, uh, I won't show all the details here because it gets a little bit into the weeds, but if you want to know all the details, they're hopefully um, in this, this JGR paper. The, the basic concept is that we can use the, the sign of the cross-correlation function as a proxy for the polarization or the polarity of the observations. And, you know, that's you know, in, in a sort of ideal or simple case, if you have a fault that slips in one direction and you have the same fault that slips in the opposite direction, you generate exactly the same seismogram, but you flip it in polarity. You know, you have a, a factor minus one difference. So here's an example of a catalog event, a template event. Here's P wave and S wave. And we run along, we compare it to this event in the underlying data. And you know, you can see it kind of fits, but it's not a really great fit. If we flip the polarity of actually both the P wave and the S wave in this case, you can see you improve the fit um, substantially. And that's, that's shown here. These are the correlation functions with lag time. And the negative part is the dashed line here. I've just flipped it up so you can directly compare the amplitudes. So here, this is showing the negative part of the cross-correlation function. The highest um, absolute value cross-correlation is the, the negative here, and that's showing shown in this alignment here. Or sorry, that's for the, the P wave. So that's shown in, in this alignment here. And similarly, for the S wave, the highest absolute value is also negative, although the difference um, with the highest positive peak is, is smaller. So essentially, we can take the, the sign of the maximum absolute value cross correlation as a proxy for the relative um, polarity of these events. And importantly, we weight that measurement by the difference between the peak and the, the secondary peak here. So if, if they're almost the same, then we say, well, we really don't know which this is, but we'll put it in just with a small weight. So the, the general philosophy is to include as much data as possible because there is information even in these noisy measurements, but just make sure that we're weighting things appropriately. So essentially we can, we can boil down all these observations, um, these relative polarity observations to, um, to group events 
We use uh, hierarchical clustering to group events that have similar patterns of polarities across the network. And this is a plot just showing those groups of similar patterns of polarities. And you can see there's, there's, no, mech there's no location information that goes into this grouping, but the, the groups do correspond pretty well with the patterns that you see in the locations. We can take this one step farther and actually solve for, um, solve for the focal mechanisms that go through this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm skipping some steps, I apologize. But um, these eight focal mechanisms here correspond to the, the light colored events um, in this map view and this cross section. And you can see, you know, many of them uh, here, 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 here have similar focal mechanisms. They look like they're left lateral, you know, north south striking. Um, strike slip events, but actually, you know, if you compare the red and the blue, you can see a difference in strike that is mirrored in the difference in strike of the focal mechanisms. So we're distinguishing, you know, relatively subtle patterns um, in these groups of events. And interestingly, it looks like there is, you know, kind of a depth at which, you know, somewhere between five and a half and six kilometers depth where the orientations of these things change from you know, this kind of orientation to more of a uh, north, northwest, uh, south, southeast orientation. I should mention that uh, deviating from these substantially, there's this the yellow group and the cyan group here that are, rather than being left lateral, they appear to be right lateral and perhaps oblique, normal folding um, in this orientation. And those would be kind of conjugate um, orientations for the, the main structure. This is just plotting um, each focal, me focal mechanism group separately. It's a little bit hard to see on here, but again, it just, just noting that the um, a pretty good correspondence and that the differences between the mechanisms groups are mirrored in the differences in the location patterns. Uh, so if we compare this to, there's only a, a uh, relatively small percentage of events with sort of routine uh, focal mechanisms that are constructed. And the P and the T axis for all those events are these are the little dots and they're color coded by whatever mechanism group they end up in after our analysis. You can see and then the diamonds are the P and T axes for these mechanisms. Um, you can see there is a pretty good general correspondence between the catalog events and, sorry, the catalog mechanisms and our correlation derived mechanisms. But the important thing is that the sort of intergroup, sorry, intragroup variability, the variability in mechanisms uh, within a single um, cluster exceeds the differences between the different groups. That is, if you wanted to compare two different earthquakes based on the catalog mechanisms, you have no idea whether that difference is purely uncertainty or whether it reflects real differences in the faulting orientations. So in that sense, um, I think the, the correlation derived mechanisms are, are a big improvement over the catalog. Not to mention that we've gone from, you know, having focal mechanism estimations for just a, a very small fraction of events to having focal mechanism um, estimates for events that aren't even in the catalog to begin with. These are the routine... <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't quite hear? So these are the routine catalog mechanisms. So the Northern California Seismic Network if an event meets certain criteria, they will calculate a focal mechanism automatically. <coughs> and that's what we're comparing with here. Okay, so this, this is just an animation showing kind of the focal mechanism heterogeneity throughout the swarm. Um, this is a fixed number of events rather than being uh, linear in time. You can see these cyan events are embedded here. These are, you know, what you might consider kind of knots in the in the folding here. They're um, 
where you have faults that are probably at 60 degrees or so to the main orientation. You can't really see those even in the, in the precise locations. You can see certain times where things are pretty homogeneous. You see a single kind of event mechanism dominating, and then you see other times where you see things kind of all mixed together. You know, in particular, you might note the, the blue and the yellow here are very different focal mechanisms, and they stand out uh, you know, very clearly even if you're just looking at the sort of the raw cross-correlation measurements. Um, and they're really mixed in here uh, together. So that's kind of interesting that you have events with such different mechanisms that are sort of coexisting there. Okay, and the final thing I'll show is that uh, based on this analysis, there may be uh, some difference between the orientation in seismicity and the orientation of falling. And I didn't mention it before, but each of these mechanisms has kind of a, a heavy line that is um, it's just a visual estimate of the, the location patterns, the location um, orientations. What we see in general is that there tends to be about a, anywhere from a 5 to a 20 degree uh, bias in if we compare the, the seismicity trend versus the, the mechanism orientation or the, the slip orientation. And, you know, we, we tried to explain this just, we looked into like using a 3D velocity model. Uh, it didn't seem like that was enough to explain it, although I don't think we completely ruled that out. But at least a plausible explanation is that this is caused by a geometry where you have interlinked shear and dilational faulting. So, you know, in this example, this is what you see in the seismicity trend, but when you look at the focal mechanisms, this is the orientation you see. And that's a bit speculative, but we do see, you know, these kinds of structures in geology. And, you know, here's an example of, of a dilational jog that's filled with a quartz vein here. Um, I think there, there may be better examples out there in the literature, but, you know, this isn't a completely fanciful idea that there is evidence for this in the geology. Okay, so just to summarize, um, looking at... The, couple swarms and actually other swarms elsewhere. Swarms aren't stationary, that there's essentially always migration in these swarms. They're not blobs. We see kind of a, a variation from a fracture mesh end member to a single fault end member in most swarms or some mix of the two. Uh, we've seen evidence that the fluid pressure diffusion and faulting are really tightly intertwined. They're highly coupled processes. Um, the degree of fluid confinement may influence the frequency magnitude distribution, um, that is the B value. And I guess I'm done. Uh, we, can, we can use all these millions of cross-correlation measurements that we've been doing anyway to help constrain the focal mechanisms of the microseismicity. So that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Further questions? All right. Um, so if you have things going on like uh, dilation, uh, might you physically expect some non-double couple? Component? And could you ever see that with your method of uh, Yeah. Uh, so I'll go back to this diagram. So we, yeah, there there is reason to expect that there could be some non-double couple component to these earthquakes. Basically, we don't have the data to observe it. What we can say is that these are not, you know, purely isotropic events. They're not dominantly isotropic events. They're dominantly shear events. But whether there's 10% or 20% of a volumetric component in this in these events, we just can't say based on the data we have. What we can say is that we can fit the data well with a double couple mechanism and we can't really say much beyond that. Um, so whether, you know, if this kind of geometry is true, we don't 
We don't know, even in this case, whether we would see an isotropic or a, a volumetric component in the, fo in the focal mechanism, and that just depends sort of on the speed of the, of the dilational part. If, if the shear slip is rapid, but the dilation is slower, then we might still see purely double couple mechanisms, even if there is a volumetric component in the overall process. So the R squared with patients from both P and S, uh, I mean, what if you only use either P or S? Because if there's fluid involved, the, the, the VPS region may be like, substantially very. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in theory, both the P wave and the S wave velocities could change. Um, and the VPVS ratio could change. Um, so usually the changes, the, v, the VPVS ratio can change by a larger fraction, which I think is what you're getting at. But I, th um, you know, we're using both P and S wave differential times, but we're not using um, explicitly sort of uh, S, to S minus P times. Um, so I, I think mostly we're sensitive to the changes in absolute P and S wave velocity. And those, you know, even if we're really filling up this zone with fluid, those, you know, in most cases where those have been seen, they're very small, you know, like a tenth of a percent or something like that in terms of seismic velocities. Um, so I don't think they would affect the locations very much. It would be interesting to go back and try to see if we could see any evidence for that, because that would be, you know, an, another uh, piece to use to try to interpret this. If we could see a, a velocity change or a VPVS change, um, in most cases the seismicity doesn't come back to exactly where it's been in the past. It basically happens once and then it's it's done. But I think you could probably do something to, to try to look at the velocity changes, and that, that would be interesting, you know, to at least get that constraint. Uh, so based on the conclusion that you mentioned, uh, So uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question exactly, but uh, the interpretation is actually, I think, the opposite of what you're saying, that what we see is that um, a low B value, so that is a higher fraction of larger events, uh, corresponds to where we have seismicity that seems to be concentrated mostly on a single fault. And the hypothesis is that you know, that that may be reflecting, you know, that if these events are triggered by fluid pressure uh, perturbations, that that may be reflecting that you're effectively confining the pressure on that fault. And if that's true, then, you know, the next events are going to tend, the fluid pressure is going to tend to, you know, essentially expand along that same fault. And if you have a relatively large fault in one place, it may continue on and that, so instead of randomly sampling the Earth's crust, you're essentially sampling the extension of this fault. So that changes the sort of the distribution of fault lengths that you're sampling in this case. And that could change the B value in that you're not constrained by the physical limits of this crack. You're just constrained by you know the heterogeneity or of stress or fluid pressure on that structure. So maybe you want to say you're the rest of your question again, if the question was that maybe you are trapping the water very simple in some places, and then suddenly you're releasing the pressure. In your mechanism, ball is happening slowly. Means that you have a diffusion process. 
Uh, what if you open the valve so fast? That's going to compress your water very suddenly. And that's going to probably going to make it stronger. Right. Why, why do you say that? Because you are suddenly releasing the water pressure, right? If you open the valve suddenly. Opening the valve means greater failure. So Sure, but, but why would it affect the distribution of event sizes? Maybe no kind of effect, not really. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I completely follow, but um, maybe we can talk more about it afterwards. Yeah, I think it would be good to communicate later uh, in the interest of time. Can we remind how deep are these events again? Between five and seven kilometers below the surface. So, do you see any evidence um, of this migration at the surface itself? Say that are measurable with geodetic means, like in CERN or? Yeah, we we've looked for some sort of surface manifestation. You're talking about deformation. Right. So you, it it turns out there is a long baseline strain meter that is essentially right above the source zone. You can see offsets on that related to the magnitude three and a half earthquakes. But there's no, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that there's, you know, uh, that there's other deformation that's being detected at the surface. We've also looked for fluid, you know, uh, people look for changes in fluid chemistry at the surface and not seen anything. And, you know, seismically, it's sort of the last signs of these things are at, you see a little spots at three and a half or four kilometers, and then they basically disappear. And the, the top two kilometers or so is caldera fill, this area that filled in after the caldera collapse. And it's expected that there may be kind of lateral propagation um, just below that zone. So it may be that things don't quite, at the fluid standpoint, don't quite make it up to the surface. But it would be cool if we saw that. Okay, then, since uh, David is around uh, for at least a few hours after the talk, uh, if you want to talk with him further, please do so. I want to thank you very much. Thanks very much.